program brought to you by Igenis Healthcare Nutrition. We're going to be talking tonight about the role of fish consumption and omega-3 in mood disorders and specifically focusing on depression. So I hope very much that we can uh, cover lots of exciting information for you tonight and give you lots of um, useful references and uh, clinical evidence to support the role of fish and omega-3 and perhaps why we need to be thinking a little bit more about bringing this into our day-to-day -day, um, therapeutic options. So I shall pass you all over to Dr. Nina Bailey who will take you through an in-depth um, look at the literature and the science behind this topic. Without further ado, fire away Nina. Uh, thank you very much, Sophie, and um, welcome everybody tonight. Um, I'm going to kick off this afternoon or this evening um, detailing a little bit about fish consumption and the role of omega-3 uh, in depression, and then Sophie's going to clarify uh, some of the evidence actually relating to fish oil supplements themselves. Um, so I'll start off with uh, some of the sort of general stats that we're all pretty much familiar with when we're looking at uh, uh, incidents of depression. Um, one in four British adults experience at least one diagnosable mental health problem in a year, um, and it's probably very likely that uh, you personally will know somebody or will know somebody who knows somebody who has suffered um, at depression at some point. Now, according to uh, the World Health Organization, uh, it's estimated that around 450 million people worldwide have a mental health problem, so that's an awful lot. Um, and depression is projected to become the leading cause of global burden of disease by um, 2030, um, with the steepest increase uh, in aging societies and countries with low and middle incomes. Um, impact on the NHS is absolutely massive. Um, local authorities spend around five billion on adult mental health services, um, that was in 2006-2007, and the increase has, um, from 2001 to 2002 was 3.6 billion, so it's going up at quite a rate. The actual amount of money that's spent on antidepressants um, in 2007 was uh, 276 million pounds, so not all of that is necessarily related uh, to antidepressants in treating depression, because obviously a lot of antidepressants are used as pain relief as well, but that's still a lot of money on antidepressants. And given that they come with such a myriad of side effects, it's not surprising that uh, depression sufferers and practitioners themselves are looking at viable alternatives to uh, pharmaceuticals. So we know that depression is a major public health issue, certainly in developed countries. Um, but there's also an awful lot of evidence that suggests that if you have depression, then you're likely at some point um, to possibly uh, have some uh, cardiovascular disease event or you could suffer de from dementia. Sorry. So it's an independent risk factor for a lot of chronic diseases. So the most common uh, mental disorders are depression, uh, but we also have bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, and even uh, OCD comes into it. Uh, and there is a general connection between nutrition itself and physical illness, and this is generally well understood. Um, the link between nutrition and mood disorders is less generally understood. Um, and although Western diets uh, can often be not, uh, deficient sorry, in many uh, nutrients, especially vitamins, minerals, and omega-3 fatty acids, and uh, a noticeable feature of the diets of patients uh, with mental disorders is a severity of de deficiency in these nutrients. Um, and so when we sort of say Western diets, we're generally talking about uh, diets that are rich in energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods. They're high in refined grains, for example, added sugars. Um, and added omega-6 and generally low in fish, for example, and fresh fruit and veg. So it, it's not surprising that uh, this can lead to deficiencies. Um, and so the link between fish consumption and mood disorders is, is pretty well understood. 
Um, and this is probably one of the most heavily cited graphs when it comes to looking at the link between fish consumption and depression. Um, and what the graph generally shows is that Asian countries, so those countries with a very high fish consumption, have the lowest uh, depression rates or prevalence. Um, and we can actually also see the same uh, association for bipolar and schizophrenia. And uh, the UK are actually featured on the on these graphs here. So same same sort of general pattern. So that we know that the more fish you eat, the more likely it is that you will not develop um, a mood disorder. So what is it exactly about fish that um, is preventing or pro protecting us from uh, developing mood disorders? Um, so marine products, uh, so that's fish, shellfish, uh, and so on, they are actually, they're a unique nutritional package, so it's not just about omega-3s, um, they're rich in essential micronutrients, for example, so essential uh, vitamins and minerals, and they act as cofactors for uh, many neurological processes, so for example, uh, the production of uh, neurotransmitters, so serotonin and dopamine, um, but they're also uh, cofactors for uh, methylation, um, for example, deficiencies in uh, B vitamins, folate, B6, B12, can result in reduced levels of methylation donors that are required for neurotransmitter production. And um, low folate, B6 or B12 itself, can result in elevated homocysteine levels, which is a risk factor itself for depression and cardiovascular disease and dementia. Um, Marine products are also a very good source of protein, so they're rich in tryptophan, for example, the amino acid that's the direct precursor to serotonin, and phenylalanine, the precursor to dopamine. And of course, when we, when we think of fish, we generally think of it as, as our main source of preformed long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Um, obviously, the, the amount of EPA and DHA differs between oily fish and white fish. So if we look at um, studies that uh, compare country to country, we can see that there is an association, but when we look at possibly sort of countries themselves and look within those countries, um, some of those observational studies may not show an association between fish intake and depression. And it's the inconsistency in these studies that sort of makes us look at uh, various factors. And some of the differences can be um, explained by other dietary habits of the populations, for example, their lifestyle, um, the actual dietary assessment methods used, for example, uh, recall and uh, food uh, uh, um, so, sorry, food diaries um, used to actually assess the amount of fish or omega-3s that are actually consumed. Um, and so there's a lot of potential co-founding factors. Um, but then if we actually look at the fish intake itself, um, there are many different uh, areas that we really need to consider. So the type of fish, for example, is it oily, is it white? Um, oily fish, uh, they, they retain their omega-3 or they accumulate their omega-3 within the flesh, whereas white fish, um, they retain it in their livers and the livers are generally uh, discarded during the gutting process. Is the fish farmed or wild because that can make a dis uh, uh, difference as well. And also seasonality. So there's, there's various factors there. Um, we also need to look at the omega-3 content and the omega-6 content. Omega-3 fatty acids are uh, generally considered to be anti-inflammatory, um, but the omega-6 family are uh, generally considered to be inflammatory. Um, and some fish species are actually quite uh, rich in um, inflammatory arachidonic acid, for example, um, uh, such as uh, tilapia, uh, especially farmed tilapia. We also need to look at the EPA to DHA ratio within the uh, fish that we're consuming. Um, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. I think Sophie's probably going to cover that as well. Um, but the EPA to re DHA ratio is one of the really significant areas that we need to look at. Um, cooking methods are also important. Um, if we eat a lot of fried fish, for example, it changes the composition um, and can actually increase peroxidation products, for example, which can induce inflammation. So we need to consider that as well. 
Um, and then also there's the frequency of consumption. Um, the omega-3 contents of cell membranes has to be well maintained. Um, the clearance of EPA in particular is much higher than DHA and to maintain levels it's best um, that we take omega-3 in um, sort of daily at least um, to maintain uh, relatively decent sort of levels. So if we just have a quick look at a, a table that I've, I've drawn up here, this is from a, a, a paper by Welsh et al. in 2002 um, and it's really looking at the type of fish at the top sort of I think it's seven top seven fish um, from ten European countries and if we see down the end you're gonna have to forgive my pen darting around just for a minute if you see the United Kingdom um, our top favorite fish is actually cod which is a white fish um, the second one down is tuna. Um, quite often tuna is canned, um, so it doesn't retain the levels of omega-3 that uh, fresh tuna would, for example. Um, and in fact, cod is actually pretty much a favorite for, for many of the, the 10 European countries. So um, there is a big difference between the types of uh, fish that we eat and the amount of omega-3 and omega uh, EPA and DHA within those fish, for example. So moving to my next slide, and I've just highlighted really um, the fish that uh, we in the UK generally eat uh, as, as taken from the slide previous. Um, so if we look at uh, tuna, for example, if we eat fresh tuna, it's nice and high in EPA and DHA. Um, but as soon as we can it, we lose a lot of the uh, omega-3 and um, the EPA and DHA content, sorry. Again, um, Atlantic farmed salmon, which is probably the majority of us are consuming this. Don't tend to see that much wild salmon these days on offer supermarkets. Um, mackerel, herring, uh, again, cod and haddock. Um, so the EPA and DHA content differs significantly, but if we actually look at the DHA to EPA ratio within different fish species, again, um, this is quite significant as well. So within tuna fish, it's 4.8 to 1 DHA to EPA, but cod is very, very heavy at um, 38.5 to 1. Um, so generally, I think possibly the biggest intake of cod is probably on a Friday, or eat alongside chips. But there we go. Um, so if you want the best source of EPA and DHA, it's found in oily fish. And these uh, long-chain fatty acids are known to play an important role within the brain. Um, they play a role in cell signaling, in transduction. Um, they play a role in receptor density regulation and um, through metabolite production. So they give rise to eicosanoids and docosanoids, so um, anti-inflammatory products that are generally neuroprotective. Um, some of the mechanisms by which omega-3s are thought to affect um, various aspects that are related to depression include, as I've noted, um, the regulation of serotonin and dopamine neurotransmission, um, but also uh, the expression of various growth factors within the brain. Um, they are known to play a role in the HPA axis, so our sort of inbuilt mechanism for dealing with stress. Um, and one of the biggest areas is their role in uh, neuroinflammation or protecting against inflammation within the brain. Um, we know that uh, red blood cell membranes of depressed subjects are generally low in omega-3 long-chain fatty acids and um, the amount of uh, omega-3 and especially EPA are, are correlated with the severity of depression. We also know that a high arachidonic acid to EPA ratio and high levels of inflammatory products, and these are uh, products that are derived from the omega-6 uh, arachidonic acid, are directly correlated with the severity of depression. And so just sort of going for a minute, just have a little chat about the arachidonic acid EPA ratio. Um, so the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid pathways, as you're probably aware of, um, not only do they incorporate into our cell membranes where they play a direct role in cell fluidity, um, but they give rise to uh, a series of cosinoid products with opposing effects within the body. So as I said, 
Um, those derived from arachidonic acid tend to be inflammatory, and those derived from EPA are anti-inflammatory. And um, DHA is slightly different in that it's considered more of a structural fatty acid, so it plays uh, an important role in sort of cell membrane fluidity rather than a sort of physiological role. Um, and between them, AA and EPA, uh, they regulate inflammation, they regulate uh, immunity, cardiovascular health, um, they play a role in brain structure and function, and they also play a role in gene expression related to the cell cycle, so cell death, um, proliferation, differentiation, and so on. And so here's my slide that really sort of uh, just sort of highlights again um, the type of eicosanoids that are, are produced from long-chain uh, omega-6 and long-chain omega-3. Um, omega-6 pathways, actually, it, it can uh, veer two ways. Um, so the omega-6 DGLA, derived from GLA found in even primrose oil, for example, can actually give rise to anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. Or if uh, omega-3 levels are low, it actually shifts to an inflammatory pathway and, and converts to arachidonic acid, which gives rise to our pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. Um, so, whilst the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has sort of long-standing been a good indication of general health status, the AA to EPA ratio, so our long-chain omega-3 and our long-chain omega-6, um, the ratio of these two specific long-chain fats is a direct me measure of inflammation within the body. Um, and anywhere between sort of 1.5 to 3 to 1 um, is considered to be generally good for you. And anything over 15 um, is, is indicating sort of high inflammation within the body with a generally sort of poor health outcome. So anything over about 15 to 1. And uh, going back to relating the arachidonic acid EPA ratio to depression, we have a study here by Adams. Uh, this is quite an old one, 1996. But they show a direct uh, significant correlation between the arachidonic acid to EPA ratio and the severity of depression as rated by the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. And then on the um, right-hand side, uh, uh, the second linear rating scale. So, so both came back with uh, significant effect um, correlations between EPA as well. Um, so we know that uh, if you've got high arachidonic acid, you're going to be producing pro-inflammatory products that drive um, the immune system to produce pro-inflammatory products called cytokines. And direct levels of inflammatory cytokines um, can act within the brain, and they literally um, they can shrink your brain, so that they're, they're involved in sort of cell death of neurons. Um, and in depression, they act in in various areas of the brain that are known to be involved in processing emotional stimuli. Um, dietary intake of omega-3, in contrast, is linked to gray matter volume and cognitive function, especially in the elderly. So we know that um, if you eat a lot of fish, you tend to have literally bigger brains. So you've got more gray matter. Um, we know that atrophy of certain areas of the brain is also associated with depressed symptoms in older people. Um, and interestingly, high blood plasma EPA, but not DHA, has been associated with lower um, gray matter uh, atrophy in certain areas of the brain. And pro-inflammatory cytokines, they also are known to have a direct role in, um, in activating the HPA axis. So this is our inbuilt uh, mechanism by which we deal with everyday stress. And if you uh, have far too much stress, very simply I know, but if you have far too much stress, then the HPA axis um, can go into sort of overload. And dysfunction, uh, dysfunction of the HPA axis itself can lead to um, depression, um, and uh, this can lead to inflammation again, which can uh, increase your risk of developing depression. And the reason I put this nice little triangle here is to, to sort of go back to this sort of link between depression and cardiovascular disease and link between depression and dementia. Because if we look at the biomarkers, um, such as omega-3 levels within red 
blood cell membranes for cardiovascular disease, for dementia, um, and for depression. Low levels are attributed to all of these conditions, and inflammation is um, attributed to all these conditions. So, um, essentially, if we can treat depression, there's a possibility of being able to treat other uh, chronic disorders. So, what about cytokines and serotonin itself? Well, we know cytokines activate various enzymes within the body, which are known to degrade serotonin, and this itself can result in low neurotransmitter levels. Um, we know that serotonin transporter activity, which is involved in recycling serotonin, is increased by certain pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and so if we, recycling, if we recycle serotonin too much, um, we actually have a, a reduction in serotonin activity. Um, interestingly, uh, EPA, direct EPA supplementation has been shown in um, and depressed individuals to lower levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and to lower cortisol levels in depressed individuals um, and has been shown to be as effective in fact as uh, some standard uh, pharmaceutical antidepressants. Um, and another area is the role of nerve growth factors, um, and these play a direct role in the plasticity and the survival of the developed adult uh, nervous system. And we know that uh, um, levels are decreased in mood disorders. Um, one of the proposed mechanisms for uh, the neuroprotective role attributed to omega-3 in mood disorders is via the normalization of, um, of, of neurotrophic factors. Um, and so my, my graph here, or my table, sorry, here, is really to show um, how fish intake um, can not only affect the individual uh, fatty acids, EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid, um, but it can also obviously um, impact on the total omega-3 intake. But the bottom line here shows the uh, direct arachidonic acid EPA ratio. So this is a, a small population of 104 people, um, and their frequency of fish intake uh, was through, I think it was uh, food frequency questionnaires. Um, and as you can see, the majority of people, 44 out of 104, actually uh, ate less than 100 grams of fish per week. 29 ate between uh, 100 and 200 grams per week. Um, and actually only 17 ate 300 grams and more. Now, when we consider that 140 grams, around about 140 grams, is equal to one portion, um, then the lowest group were actually eating less than one portion of fish a week. So that's not an awful lot. And when it sort of relates to actual omega-3 content, it, it's really relatively low. Um, and as you can see, that arachidonic acid EPA ratio of the lowest group was actually really rather high at 20.4. Um, and if you remember back to my slide uh, a few slides back, when I'm talking about the arachidonic acid EPA ratio as a measure of inflammation, and anything over 15 is considered to be really quite inflammatory, you can see that um, low fish intake is a direct can be directly correlated with a, a, a direct um, AA EPA ratio. Um, increasing fish intake up to just over two portions of, of fish per week can actually bring that down quite nicely. So it is possible to modulate the arachidonic acid EPA ratio through fish consumption. So um, it's quite reassuring. Or is it? Is fish consumption therapeutic? Mm, technically, no. Um, generally, we are told that we should be consuming two portions of fish per week. So that's, as I said, uh, 140 grams is one portion. One should be oily and one should be white. And that would give us around 450 milligrams per day. Um, the actual intake within the UK is half of that, so it's about 244 milligrams per day. And if you're a non-fish eater, you're consuming less than uh, 50 milligrams a day. So you really are sort of having issues with your omega, long chain omega-3 intake. Another area is uh, contamination issues with um, oily fish, certainly. Um, we have methyl mercury um, uh, contamination, dioxins, and PCBs. And so 
if you're thinking of the sound is beginning to cut out. Okay. Sorry, I've just only just noticed the comments coming in on the side. Is I everybody okay there? I think it's then? okay again now, Nina. It, w it did seem to go for a minute there, but I think it's back. So as long as everyone can still right. hear us, it's okay. probably okay to carry on. Just, okay. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm just about to start summarizing anyway. So so fish consumption, uh, we, we can make some modification with our... Uh, omega-3 intake and to uh, modulate our arachidonic acid EPA ratio as well um, but really sort of looking at con uh, fish consumption to, to do this therapeutically is not really an option um, and this is why ethyl EPA supplements uh, offer a convenient way to provide the body with the therapeutic levels of EPA that may not be possible through diet alone. So uh, using supplements rather than fish itself, um, we get the concentrations that we need, but we also get the, the purity um, and the safety um, that we need when we're, when we're looking at high dosing uh, fish oils. Um, and so just to, to go over my last slide, which is really a kind of a summary of, of what EPA supplements can actually do. Um, and this is sort of derived from uh, various studies looking directly at um, EPA supplementation in depression. Um, EPA is known to regulate neurotransmitter function. Uh, it's known to improve cell signaling, transduction, receptor density regulation. Direct EPA supplementation reduces cholesterol levels. Uh, it restores a, a nice healthy arachidonic acid to EPA ratio. And by doing that, we automatically start regulating our, uh, our overinflammation. So we reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines. We increase anti-inflammatory products. Um, EPA is also neuroprotective. Um, it maintains cell membrane integrity and basically what this means is that it uh, inhibits the activity of various phospholipase, so phospholipase A2 for example, which uh, removes fatty acids from cell membranes. So it helps to preserve long chain fatty acids within our cell membranes. Um, and it, uh, it regulates various nerve growth factors which are known to play a role in um, sort of cell density within the brain. So hopefully there's a little bit of evidence as to a role for fish um, in, dementia, uh, sorry, in depression um, and how uh, specifically EPA itself um, and supplementing with EPA can help in depression. And I'm going to pass you over to Sophie now and she's just going to go over some of the studies uh, that uh, show EPA in, in treating depression. So I'm going to hand you over now, Sophie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nina. Very informative, very lovely talk as always. So uh, hopefully everyone's got a nice good background and understanding of why the fish and omega-3 story is so important when it comes to mood disorders and the fact that mood disorder spectrum is such a prevalent problem these days. Um, it really does need to be something we're thinking about. So as Nina said, I'm just going to take you through more of the scientific evidence story with regard to how we've kind of drawn all of these conclusions through the science, um, just to give you a really good background and hopefully to make you really believe that there is a real support in the scientific literature for all of this. So following from the clear role of omega-3 in mood, um, and the fact that we now recognize that we need to supplement because therapeutically fish consumption, consumption just isn't enough. Um, this area has actually been researched quite considerably. Um, but despite the large number of studies, the results from the various different trials tend to be quite conflicting and actually have caused quite a lot of confusion due to the wide range of um, outcomes. Differences in these studies tend to be largely due to um, very different numbers of subjects involved within the studies but also due to the very different populations that are studied, um, the severity of the population, the age of the population, um, that all seems to be quite different from study to study which is why the overall outcomes tend to have 
very broad ranging uh, conclusions. The type, concentration and duration of the fatty acid supplement used is actually also another major reason why there's so many discrepancies seen and we'll, we'll see a little bit more why. Um, in the next few slides. But it's now kind of agreed and understood that the ratio of the specific long chain fats within the supplements is really very important. So you need to be getting the right balance of EPA in comparison to DHA long chain fat in your supplement. So I'm going to go over a few slides from a few years back that just talk about the early studies that look at omega-3 as a whole. So in a study carried out by De Silva and colleagues, they found that in Parkinson's disease patients who also suffered from depression, that there was a significant improvement in the severity score of depression when long chain fatty acids were supplemented for three months. Now these people in the study took 720 milligrams of EPA plus 480 milligrams per day. Um, or they were given a placebo and the benefits with fish oil consumption were actually seen independently of whether or not these patients were taking antidepressants in combination or whether they were just supplementing fish oil on their own. Um, also the long chain fatty acid content of the erythrocyte cells was shown to increase in the groups that were taking fish oil. In another study, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial carried out in 2008, um, we actually, they looked at people age 65 and over, and they were randomly assigned to consume just over two grams of fish oil a day, a combination of EPA and DHA, but very, very high in this case in EPA, um, or again placebo. And this was looked at for a period of 26 weeks. Um, but despite the high levels of omega-3 intake and EPA specifically, and the length at which the supplement was taken, there was no observed effect overall on the mental well-being of this general population of older people. But this study was carried out in a population that didn't have a diagnosis of mood disorder. It was just trying to understand whether or not omega-3s could be preventative or could have a general well-being impact. Converse to this, a study using just 20 major depressive disorder children carried out in 2006 looked at relatively low levels of a combined EPA and DHA supplement. And the children took these daily for a period of 16 weeks and even though the dose was relatively low, from eight weeks onward the omega-3 supplementation group were found to have significantly reduced scores of depression versus the um, placebo group. So very, very different results to, to the other studies seen here. In another study carried out, um, a group of 122 major depressive disorder patients with cardiovascular disease um, who were already on the serotonin reuptake inhibitor drug, uh, stertraline, um, it was found that taking two grams of omega-3 ethyl ester form, both EPA and and DHA for 10 weeks, even though it was a good period of time and quite a high dose, um, there was no difference between the depression outcome at the end point versus placebo. Again, another study looking at um, a patient group with major depressive episode this time, so an acute depressive disorder rather than a chronic depressive um, condition, taking very, very high EPA in comparison to DHA for a, a, plus, a period of eight weeks or taking placebo. In the whole patient group, there was a trend, although not significant, towards a reduction in depressive symptoms. But when they took out the patients that also suffered from anxiety as a comorbid condition with their depression, there was a really, really clear benefit for omega-3 supplementation over placebo in just the depression without anxiety patients. 
So a few studies there, um, and all with quite vast and varied outcomes, despite some similar and some very different treatment protocols. So it's easy to see why this area has in the past been thought to be really confusing and conflicting and lots of the overall conclusions have been that basically omega-3s don't really show any benefits. So very difficult to draw firm conclusions about the therapeutic effect of omega-3. In order to really clarify what's going on here, a number of meta-analyses have been carried out and this is where we pull all of the studies together that meet a certain strict and rigid analysis criteria and then they look at the various different overall findings and the studies generally have found that EPA, DHA and their metabolites have different effects within the body and that generally EPA seems to be the clinically beneficial omega-3 over and above that of DHA. Due to these findings and the, the increasing understanding that the two um, major long-chain fatty acids, EPA and DHA, have different effects within the body, as well as the fact that they actually compete within the body for incorporation into the cells, for um, cleavage into their active forms, um, it's no longer considered accurate by the scientific community to actually consider omega-3 as one generic nutrient. We need to really separate them out and look at them differently. So that's exactly what's been done in the recent research. People are starting to take the two, EPA and DHA, and compare those to one another as well as comparing them independently to placebo. So the first of two of the really fundamental meta-analyses that have clarified the area up quite a lot was carried out in 2009 by Martins. Now he did a literature search and found over 240 studies that all related to omega-3 use as a therapeutic in mood disorders and particularly depression, but of these, only 28, which is approximately 10%, just over 10% met his strict inclusion criteria. So you can already see that if you're only getting 28 out of 241 studies that can actually be used in a meta-analysis, there must be considerable variation in what's going on in the scientific community, meaning that a lot of the studies weren't rigorous enough, they didn't contain enough people, their endpoints didn't perhaps meet a certain clinical um, level. So it does become quite clear that this area is, is under-resourced in terms of really understanding what's going on. And the major findings from Martin's um, meta-analysis was that generally the greater the severity and the lower the amount of DHA in comparison to EPA within a supplement meant that omega-3 supplementation was increasingly more effective. So the more severe the depression and the more EPA used, then the more clinical benefit that we see. The other thing he noted was that when the analysis was broken down into various different subgroups, the type of mood disorder that the population being studied had, as well as um, whether or not they had a pre-diagnosed condition or it was being used as a preventative inter intervention and also whether or not they were receiving other therapies was um, really important in determining whether or not there was any change or any benefit from taking the supplement and of course the supplement type was really really important and the two points at the bottom of this slide here just highlight the fact that the majority of studies that were included in this meta-analysis found that pure DHA studies or studies containing greater than 50% of DHA generally showed up as being quite negative. Um, in contrast, the studies that he was able to include that had high EPA greater than 50% um, or were using pure ethyl EPA specifically, then these were the ones that showed real significant benefits in terms of treating depression. To really further clarify the area, another sub 
um, meta-analysis was carried out by Subletti in 2011 um, and this again highlighted that the major importance when it comes to therapeutic benefit is having EPA in excess of 60% of the content of omega-3 within the supplement and there was a much greater benefit seen in supplements that did have a greater than 60% EPA content versus those with less. Generally, again, as with the Martins study, any supplement with lower than 60% EPA, the outcome of the study was usually ineffective in treating depression, and that you needed anything between 200 and 2,200 milligrams more EPA in comparison to DHA for the supplement regime to be effective against primary depression. So this is just a forest plot taken from the Subletti study which shows us on the left hand side all of the studies that were included and in the analysis and then the various different dots on the right are plotted according to benefit in favor of either taking polyunsaturated fatty acids or whether a placebo was as beneficial or more beneficial or whether there was no difference and the top half of the study with all of the black dots just shows the studies that used predominantly EPA supplements with greater than 60% EPA of the total omega-3 and all but one of them was in favor of using these EPA rich supplements to treat depression so we're seeing a real difference with these studies in comparison to other studies um, when using high EPA and the dot right at the bottom there excuse my little pencil this big blob was the average of the whole group of high EPA studies so you can see there there's definitely a clear benefit um, for using high EPA supplements however in the ones that use lower EPA supplements the overall outcome was that basically polyunsaturated acid, fatty acids just weren't really very therapeutically effective so this really starts to highlight why we're seeing so much confusion and why people up until recently didn't really feel as though polyunsaturated fatty acids were a major treatment option for um, treating depression so the key findings generally that the dose is really important, the length and regime used for treatment is important but most specifically the actual omega-3 fatty acid used and it's all about oils rich in EPA and specifically ethyl EPA in many of the studies that have now been carried out without any DHA or DH or EPA in excess of DHA of more than one gram a day and supplementation seems to be most effective when used for a minimum of three months to find sustained antidepressant benefits um, there have been a number of high EPA or EPA only trials now that have been carried out to further just clarify the role of fatty acids in treating depression and of course specifically EPA in understanding mood disorder relationship. So the first of these studies that I want to talk about was conducted in 2012 and this was actually a direct randomized controlled trial comparison looking at a group of individuals with mild to moderately um, diagnosed depression uh, they received either one gram of EPA or one gram of DHA or one gram of placebo each day they took this for a period of 12 weeks and then the depression rating scale score was analyzed at various different time points the EPA group only, not the DHA and not the placebo group, showed significantly lower mean depression rating score by the 12 week endpoint in comparison to the other two groups. But when we actually delve into the study a little bit further, we see that it was only 29% of the EPA group that responded. And this seems to be consistent with other studies and going back to the Martins um, meta-analysis outcomes that state that in people without a long-term and quite severe diagnosis of depression that we actually don't see a huge benefit. So although this study 
does clearly highlight that it, if you are going to see a benefit, it has to be EPA that you use. Still, because some of them were only mild or moderately depressed, they weren't responsive at all, suggesting as of course we all know that depression is a multifactorial disease, but EPA is just one of the, the important things we need to consider. And this is just a graph of the results. So you can see that the small dotted line and then the dashed line are DHA and placebo, both of which did show some reduction in severity of depression, but it was only the EPA that was really significant when it came to 12 weeks. And DHA and placebo both showed the same endpoint reduction, whereas EPA you can see there as, as about a 6% um, point score reduction. So quite a significant difference there, which is obviously good to know. So another trial uh, also carried out in 2012 by uh, Rizzo and colleagues looking at omega-3 supplementation in elderly depressed patients with a control group of non-depressed elderly subjects found that one tablespoon a day given just before a meal at lunchtime um, for a period of eight weeks this was effective in both treating depression but also in rebalancing the arachidonic acid to EPA ratio that Nina's talked to us about. And this was discovered both by doing a geriatric depression score analysis and also doing whole blood and red blood cell sampling analysis um, at baseline and the eight-week endpoint. So they, they concluded from this study that both the EPA was very effective, but also that the arachidonic acid to EPA ratio was a really good marker for tracking not only polyunsaturated fatty acid status within elderly patients, but also then being able to link that back to depression risk. So just going back to some of the mechanisms that Nina talked about, just to show you that there really is increasing scientific understanding of how there's this big link between inflammation, depression, fatty acid metabolism. This study carried out really, really recently by uh, Mocking and his research group um, found that the HPA axis is heavily linked to fatty acid metabolism and this was understood by linking up the difference between morning and afternoon cortisol levels which is our primary stress hormone that naturally fluctuate throughout the day as a result of our circadian rhythm, rhythm but also that the changes in these groups between healthy and major depressive disorder patients linked quite dramatically with fatty acid fatty acid metabolism markers but it was the only the evening um, cortisol levels that significantly correlated with the fatty acid metabolism markers and the greater the levels of cortisol the lower the long chain omega-3 fatty acid content of the cells as well as the worse the fatty acid structure of the cells seen in the major depressive disorder patients. Um, the higher evening cortisol that was seen, the lower the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the shorter the chain length, the greater the saturation, and the greater the level of peroxidation of the fatty acids in the cells. So we can see that this direct impact of the over stimulation of the stress response is really having a massive effect on the quality and the structure of the fats that's within the cells and although this relationship was seen both in major depressive disorder patients and their sex and age match controls the relationship was much more significant so it really is a profound link between stress response the HPA axis and fatty acid metabolism and this negatively, negatively is compromised in uh, major depressive disorder patients. Another study um, looking at the, the genetics involved in polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism really aimed to try and better understand the link between fatty acids and depression right down at a molecular and genetic level. And this group actually showed that there were a number of genetic polymorphisms that um, 
were found within the genes that code for the major enzymes that are associated with fatty acid metabolism, primarily phospholipase A2 and cyclooxygenase 2 or COX2. And when looked at a clinical population who were suffering from hepatitis, so obviously had quite a high inflammatory response anyway, their genetic polymorphisms were associated with a higher risk of IFN-alpha induced depression, which is interferon alpha, which is a really key player in the inflammatory response. So these people are inflamed anyway, but they're also expressing genetic polymorphisms, which are changes in our genetic code that seem to make them more susceptible to both obviously the inflammation, but also to the depression as a result. Um, lower EPA levels as well as lower DHA levels were associated with these at-risk genetic polymorphism groups. And actually the genetic variation seen in these two genes um, increased the risk of the depression, which seems to then be affecting the levels of these two fats, either directly by changes in the production of these enzymes, but also in the fact that they're linked to um, inflammatory depression as well as the infl inflammatory response. So it just really highlights that um, there is this link between inflammation and depression, and this can go right down to a genetic level. And again, this study here carried out and published um, just last month, I believe, looks at the link between cardiovascular disease, which we all heavily associate with a huge inflammatory component, um, but also in depression as well. So we're seeing a link in the markers associated both with the cardiovascular disease um, in newly diagnosed depression patients. So these are patients that haven't received any medical treatment, are otherwise considered healthy, but markers that we would associate with infl inflammation of the cardiovascular system are quite prevalent in these patients with a newly diagnosed depression. So platelet activation markers as well as atherosclerotic markers, these were both significantly higher in depressed patients as well as um, thrombosis markers and various different factors associated with blood clotting and blood stickiness and just inflammation of the vascular lining basically. So the findings in the diagnosed patients really, really emphasize that depression is linked to both an increased thrombotic cardiovascular re risk, but also a really increased pro-inflammatory state. And potentially, inflammation is the reason why we see so much crossover and increased risk with any one diagnosis of an inflammatory condition causing um, higher likelihood of developing another one. And this diagram just really highlights that point. Um, there is a considerable comorbidity associated in the literature if you have any one area that has a major inflammatory component, then you're going to see increased likelihood of developing another inflammation-based condition. So just to really sum up, the importance now and the understanding of the role of polyunsaturated fatty acids and particularly EPA within the depression and mood scientific thinking. This uh, comment and sort of review of the most recent psychiatric treatment for mood and depressive disorders was published by a uh, pharma nutrition journal. Um, Mc McNamara and Shaw are a research collaboration in America and they've just gone through what's existing and really pointed out to the scientific community and the psychiatric community that um, this needs to be something that is incorporated into our treatment protocols and I'll just read the quote here it says um, Long-chain omega-3 fatty acid supplementation has been shown to augment the therapeutic efficacy of antidepressant, mood stabilizer, and second-generation antipsychotic medications, and may additionally mitigate adverse cardiometabolic side effects. Prelimin 
preliminary evidence also suggests that long chain omega-3 fatty acid supplementation may be efficacious as a monotherapy for primary and early secondary prevention for perinatal symptoms as well. The overall cost benefit ratio endorses the incorporation of long chain omega-3 fatty acids into psychiatric treatment algorithms. So it's really nice to finally see that science is getting into practice and this is something that's being recommended by the professionals in this industry. So as a result of this, um, I genus follow the science always. We formulate everything to scientific protocol. We are, of course, an EPA fatty acid specialist. And our Farmipa restore and maintain treatment protocol really, really, really will help to target um, any mood disorders, any depression-related conditions associated with um, various different clients that you might be seeing. So please get in touch with us. Um, there's the references to my half of the talk, which will be available online very soon. And here's lots of useful contact information to get in touch with myself or Nina if you want any more information about the talk, if you want any more specific educational literature. There is the uh, website there. There's lots of nice documents and articles on there covering a range of topics. There's also the office number if you need to get hold of myself or Dr. Bailey directly and our specific contact details there. So I think we have about five minutes if anyone wanted to ask any quick questions then just um, pop that in the chat box down to the left and we will try and answer. Um, alternatively please do feel free to send us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So we just have somebody typing a message for us now so hopefully um, Okay, Sarah, there, in, with regard to samples, um, I think at the moment we're working on some samples. We don't have anything other than our chewable available at the moment. We normally give out samples at live events, so uh, do keep your eye out and see if you can um, come along to anything live. Um, if you send us an email directly to e probably myself, Sophie T at iGenus, with your details, then um, I can have a look and see if there is some way we can get some samples sent out to you. Uh, Eleanor, yes, they are. You can get them through the natural dispensary. No problem. <laughs> Glad to help. Um, so yeah, it, with regard to using our supplements, they are available through the natural dispensary if you already have a practitioner account with them. They're also available through NutriCenter if you have practitioners. Daryl, thank you very much for asking the question. Yes, we do have a special price for practitioner. If you um, get in touch with me directly or of course I can get in touch with you as I'm sure we have your contact details. Um, I can send you the details of both our practitioner trade pricing but also our practitioner scheme for recommending to clients. Um, so I will make sure that that wings its way to you in the next 24 hours. very useful for care homes yes there's um, lots of interesting information coming out about um, of course the depression link with institutionalized elderly um, as well as preventing neurodegeneration and things associated with that as well um, so I think we're probably going to have to wrap that up because my clock's ticking down the last 50 seconds of our hour slot. So if anybody has any other questions, then please, please, please email us. We do always endeavor to try and get back to you within 24 hours, so you should get a quick response. Um, and thank you all very much for attending. It's great to see so many familiar names in the attendee list. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Good evening. Bye.